Hello, how are you? Um, welcome to Sierra Tucson virtually and thanks for being here very much. Uh, thank you for taking time out of your busy day to hear about this very important topic. And the, let me tell you a little bit about the genesis of this. During the past decade almost, so much of the attention has been paid in the drug and alcohol treatment world to the opioid crisis. And of course, that's not all that's going on. There's a lot of things that are actually in play and they're going on. And alcohol, and we're going to talk about this a lot, remains clearly the most dangerous drug that we deal with. And so we felt that it was important to talk about this. And initially we said that we would do this in, um, I was supposed to be in Pittsburgh in April to talk about this for Alcohol Awareness Month. And that's really where the slides came from. And we decided that we would do this virtually because, of course, April came and went and a lot of different things happened in this country during April, predominantly the COVID-19 uh, pandemic, which we're, we're still somewhere in the midst of in one way, shape or form, state by state. So it's affected most of our lives, uh, all of our lives, really, in some way. And so... We decided that we would talk about one of the uh, couple of the effects that had come out with alcohol and uh, how it's affecting us during this time because it's, there's some very interesting data that I want to share with you today and uh, and then really uh, go into the rest of the talk as we had planned it, which is we need to remember that alcohol is a dangerous drug and it affects our patients in a, in a, in a negative, impactful way uh, and there's a lot of lives that are touched. The economic cost is huge, and so this is an important topic. And while it seems old school and, and everybody's on to just kind of whatever the new thing is in drug and alcohol treatment, this is still really the meat of the matter. And with that, I'm going to stop looking at me because I'm not the thing you want to look at today. So uh, what we're going to do is um, I'm going to move us over and get started here. We got a lot of slides to go through and I hope you enjoy this as much as I enjoy putting it together. This has definitely been a time for all of us when we've had to focus and be, we've been challenged by what's gone on individually during the COVID-19 pandemic. Certainly we have in the treatment world because it's been um, difficult at times to stay open, to stay relevant, and with a wonderful team here at Sierra Tucson, we've been able to do so. Um, so we have been up and uh, doing, and we've tried to have that heart for any fate. So I left this slide in um, essentially because I felt like uh, I looked at everything last night and, and earlier in the week and said, you know, where are we at with this? It's not Alcohol Awareness Month anymore, but guess what? This came and it went. And uh, and in so doing, it, we kind of missed an opportunity because nobody was thinking about alcohol awareness in April. We were thinking about COVID-19 awareness and this new idea. And we were really still fresh out of March and early April was a time when the country really didn't know what it was looking at. But let me harken back that one thing to remember, and our, April is just a month that we think about it, that the National Council on Alcoholism and Drug Dependence established this month. Why? Well, essentially because we uh, they realized that there was this very pernicious effect initially geared towards college kids because there's a lot of binge drinking. And while it's sort of a normal, uh, I hedge on saying that, maybe I should reel that back in. It is, it is however, a common uh, part of... Uh, college life for a lot of students, um, it, it's really got a devastating effect for a lot of people. So what we've done over time as a community has expanded this into a national movement and outreach. Uh, it's a time for us to focus on the impact of alcohol in our communities and for people who have alcohol use disorder. So we're kind of taking this writ large. It's still really April for us here at Sierra Tucson in terms of alcohol awareness. So one of the things that uh, that was very interesting that came about because of this um, this pandemic is that the way we purchase consumer goods, of course, we all know by now that it changed. And a lot of us have gotten very used to 
point and click and having things delivered or drive up service. And Drizzly was, uh, is a, a company that is uh, involved and has been involved before the pandemic with, uh, as an online marketplace. So what does that look like? Well, think of Amazon that partners with local distributors and that's what it's like and that's how it really um, moves through the state law. So Drizzly takes the order and they will work with uh, 2,200 local retailers roughly in 180 locations throughout North America. Now, they had been a successful um, uh, distributor of alcohol prior to the pandemic. However, what we learned is that during this pandemic, the alcohol sales accelerated significantly. And the last time this was looked at with Drizzly was actually in this month of March. Um, and we noticed that, uh, excuse me, in April, but alcohol sales in general uh, shot up uh, during this time frame. Sales had gone up as much as 50% by sales volume. Now that's a lot of extra alcohol consumed in the online market. Now there's more to this story. Um, as we reached the end of March, there was clearly a pattern that was emerging and online sales were up for Drizzly, up 461% compared to the two months prior. In other words, through before, if you're comparing it to early February into March, online sales went up significantly, 461%. And new buyer accounts accounted for the bulk of that by, uh, by a long shot. So what does that really mean? I mean, how do we interpret that? Um, there's just the one of many organizations that's doing this online and it's become easy and available and uh, really rather uh, uh, a simple way for people to just stay home. Now, there's a lot of things we can inject right there. I mean, we know that a lot of our, our patients and clients who are struggling with alcohol use disorder tend to be isolating drinkers. You know, we do have our bar drinkers, we have our college bench drinkers, we have the fraternity and sorority situation and where all these places where, where people in, in both the emerging adult years and uh, more advanced years, as well as the teenage years, go out and uh, quote, for lack of better words, party. But a lot of our uh, alcohol use disorder patients tend to stay home and isolate. And Drizzly's made this very easy to do. And it, Drizzly's just one of several of these online marketplaces. But they, they did have some interesting data that came out around this. Now, Nielsen and has in the Nielsen ratings for television, you know, they do more than just TV ratings. And they did some market analysis around this. Interestingly, we got to look at this for what it is. It's, it's market analysis. So their viewpoint of this, their take on this is very different than we would have here in the treatment world. Okay, so Nielsen uh, came out with some, uh, an interesting article, caught some attention in, uh, in early April that showed generally across all boards, all venues, brick and mortar, as well as online uh, uh, vendors, that alcohol sales rose 55% in the week ending March 21st. That's all alcohol. That's packaged goods out the door as well as I said online. Now, the online sales obviously accounted for a significant chunk of that. If you look at that number there, it's 243% as compared to the same period of time last year. Unequivocally, the um, stay at home orders uh, and while they may have they may have helped us in terms, and they certainly did help us in terms of social distancing and slowing the spread of the uh, SARS-CoV-2 virus that causes the COVID-19 disease. Important, absolutely. However, part of the collateral damage clearly seems to be that there was an uptick in alcohol use. Now. There's been an uptick in a lot of mental health indices, and we're going to address that just a little bit. I don't want to get too far off topic, but we do know that this has been an important trend that's happened during this uh, during this pandemic. So hard liquor, I mean, that led the way of all these these sales. They were up 75 percent in the increase year to date. Wine sales rose 66 percent, 
and beer sales were up 42%. Now, this is alcohol sales to all sources. So that's not just online, although online was up 243%. Now, Nielsen has subsequently come out with some new data around this. And it's interesting because their take on it was that, um, in response to all the attention that this got, was that the latest trends were estimating that the alcohol market in the United States would need, from a business standpoint, to sustain a 22% volume growth. And that's across all alcohol categories. Um, that are sold anywhere. And that's in order to just merely level off from the impact of the closed bars and restaurants that have happened. Interesting point. So let's just talk about that and think about that for a second. So we know that people go out and casually have a drink with dinner. You can go get a pizza and beer. You can have wine with a nice steak out at a restaurant or, or whatever you choose. Sometimes people, it's just a happy hour after work. And, and absolutely, there's a lot of alcohol sales that way. We'll, we'll go into this more in a moment, but the thing is, if you look at who purchases most of the alcohol in America, it's clearly done by the top users and consumers of alcohol. There is uh, also in marketing, and it's not really mentioned here in this Nielsen report, a thing called the Pareto Law or the Pareto Principle. And while it's a rule of thumb in a lot of areas, it tends to really follow suit and stay consistent in marketing. And as a result, advertising and marketing firms know this and use this. And that is essentially the 80% of all sales of any given commodity, any product, any widget you want to sell, they come from the top 20% of consumers. This is true of alcohol. So they, the market analysis, I'm sure with Nielsen, I, I don't want to spar with them, I'm sure it's spot on, okay, that they need to actually, in terms of the distributors and the, the, the people who sell alcohol, yeah, from a business standpoint, they need to probably uh, recoup their losses, as do a lot of businesses. However, who is purchasing all this alcohol? We need to think about that for a second. Who's actually increasing, where do we see this type of hard liquor being delivered? Because this wasn't a phenomenon that existed before. So the casual drinker, those are people who can leave that drink or take that drink. Those are not the people that we're talking about today. This clearly harkens to a different trend, okay? And this trend is important because we know that there's a lot of things that go with it. And just kind of moving on, we know that there's been a trend, we know there's been an uptick, and we know that it's been impactful in terms of collateral damage during the COVID-19 pandemic, that we have more problems arising from alcohol abuse and addiction, and we're seeing this at Sierra Tucson, specific to the pandemic. And what do I mean by that? Let me clarify my verbiage around this. Um, and it's empiric, but Many, many of our patients are now coming in and saying in our histories, and I've, I've uh, discussed this with my colleagues here, that, yeah, I stayed home and I was isolated, and they started to, do, to have uh, drugs and alcohol delivered. And I said drugs, yes. You can buy uh, you can buy things off the dark web. You can have uh, heroin delivered to your door like pizza. You can have fentanyl delivered. Uh, in essentially, uh, like Amazon, it, it can come straight from China. This is how a lot of the distribution has, but people can buy fentanyl analogs that they can use to cheat on a drug test. So in addition to Drizzly and the other online sources, we have people just staying home, point and click, and isolating. Well, we're seeing the effects of these, these relapses, and in some cases, lapses, and these are tied in with a lot of other um, psychiatric illness and diagnosis. And people with getting back to alcohol, all right, alcohol and abuse and addiction, substance use disorder, uh, have nearly 40% at one time had a lifetime psychiatric diagnosis. Um, and often we're looking at polysubstance abuse. So again, strong correlation that 30% uh, of individuals with psychiatric disorders, these are people who will exhibit substance abuse. And 25% of other alcohol and 15% of other drugs are combination alone. And 
depressed patients. So we're now 59% more severe suicidal symptoms when it's associated with substance use disorder, right? Depressed substance use disorder patients clearly have a higher prevalence of suicidal symptoms than do depressed and non-substance use disorder individuals. Depression is a major factor in relapse. We have really a perfect storm set up here. We think about people who are isolating and people about people who are who are leaving treatment. I have a lot of people who've left treatment, and our concern now is where is their relevant aftercare? And I know, and for those of you who are involved, thank you so much when you've been able to effectively Zoom or stay open perhaps, and it's an important piece of the um, overall recovery um, pathway for our patients here because Generally speaking, people would step down into aftercare and they have a robust uh, opportunity for uh, AA, NA, refuge recovery, smart recovery, all types of things that have been available in America in the past. A lot of that we take for granted uh, and that we've taken for granted in the past, that's not available to us anymore. So people are zooming in and while it works, when we have people in early sobriety, it's a difficult thing. And so there's a lot of depression, there's a lot of isolation, there's also anxiety, which isn't really uh, accounted for in this slide, but I think we recognize this as part of the collateral damage that we're seeing during this time. And in looking that up and discussing and really spending, uh, I guess obviously, a lot of time thinking about this, because it's what I deal with here, um, the Lancet came out with this very interesting and relevant and current article. This is from 2020, and it was published in February, and uh, I've got the source down at the bottom there. So they did essentially a small meta-analysis of a larger, uh, they called out about a thousand papers to do this, and then they took 24 papers and did a meta-analysis of those papers and, and looked at the long-term psychological effects from past quarantine situations. So when we've had a pandemic, say, for example, Ebola, or the SARS or MERS uh, pandemics in the past where there have been quarantines, and they're not obviously all in this country. What they found was that the uh, after quarantine, there were reported symptoms that were very significant. Alcohol abuse up at the top, PTSD, new onset of avoidance behaviors, by the way, and those were actually very prevalent and very strong in healthcare providers. These were people who said, I've had ongoing invasive, pernicious thoughts and avoidance behaviors because of the things that I saw and experienced during the time of treating individuals during the pandemic. This is from The Lancet. And we know that we're starting to see this um, currently. We, we've uh, initiated a program here at Sierra Tucson called Healthcare Heroes, which is to help those individuals specifically involved with these types of behaviors and, uh, and, and symptoms. So how big a problem are we looking at? Well, the truth is we know that uh, we're looking at something that we suspect will continue to grow, that we're only seeing the, the first waters on the shore here. Um, if you look at the size of the coronavirus lockdown, it's been significant, not just here in the United States, but worldwide. The United States is now actually the third largest country by population in the world, which actually surprised me. I, I, I thought that some of the Asian countries still outclipped us, but in point of fact, after uh, India and China, we are, uh, we are number three. And so uh, the number of people that were placed on lockdown here was significant. So when we start to piece all of this together, we know that we're looking at some things that we as healthcare professionals need to be cognizant of and moreover need to be ready for. Um, so why, why this focus on alcohol though? Um, to, to go back to comments that I made earlier, we, we know there's been this genuine concern for the opioid epidemic. Um, it, it needs to remain there because it still is relevant, um, but it has driven so much of the news cycle and the attention 
uh, that we've had for a long time that we can lose sight of the other issues, right? We can lose sight of things like alcohol, cannabis, stimulants, stimulant uh, overdoses are on the rise. Um, so this is a, a slide that I use a lot. This is actually from the CDC, and it speaks to really where we are now and where we have been. In terms of the opioid crisis, the biggest issue, if, if we really uh, were to place one single issue, currently is on the synthetic opioids. I'm going to kind of drag my mouse over here right up here. Now you're talking fentanyl. And I think most of us, you know, you, you can't really work in this field and not understand that fentanyl has been a huge impact for us. Um, and that's because fentanyl has become cheap and easy and it's exceptionally powerful and has um, actually fueled um, a financial incentive for both the cartels and an individual, um, individuals um, here in the States. You can buy fentanyl online from China. You can get the pressing machines from China, and a kilogram, which is 2.2 pounds, uh, costs around $5,000 the last I checked. That then can be repackaged for a street value of somewhere in the $1.5 million range. That's a problem, obviously. So we still know that a lot of people die from opioid overdoses every day, 128 people. That's significant. That's 5.3 persons an hour. So that's, put simply, we're going to be talking here for an hour plus, you know, roughly an hour and a half today. So we're looking at losing about seven or eight people from opioids while we speak. But the good news in all of this is it seems to be hitting a bit of an inflection point. So deaths overall from uh, drug overdoses, all drug overdoses, decreased in 2017 to 18. That's really good news. Um, Opioid-related deaths specifically decreased by 2%. Deaths associated with prescription opioids uh, decreased 13.5%. Um, uh, physicians really heard this message, and the AMA task force, as well as working with uh, Big Pharma and other state-by-state uh, -state organizations, have really revamped the way physicians think about prescribing opioids. And the period of time between 2012 and 2016, opioid prescription writing dropped by about 22%. And that's significant, and that's that's uh, you see that reflected in that number there. Heroin specifically decreased 4%, and that's a really good number. But the synthetic opioid deaths increased by 10%. And we still, I, I throw this out here, I know we're talking about alcohol, but I tell my patients it's never the one thing. It's always all of it. So that's kind of how I roll. And I think we want to just keep our eye on the ball on that piece there. However, let's look at what's going on with alcohol. It remains the most dangerous drug in America. And we forget that. Why do we forget it? Well, because it's a social lubricant for a lot of people. We labor under the pretense that, hey, everybody drinks. Um, it's uh, it's just something that is uh, part of our fabric. It's legal, and it's uh, for people of age, it's legal. And it's uh, uh, something that culturally a lot of families uh, have assimilated into their lives. So it doesn't belie the point, however, that, in, that it's attributed to at least 88,000 deaths per year. Listen, this is older data. I mean, I'll tell you, I get this from the NIH and the CDC, and it's the most recent data available from 2017. I suspect we'll be looking at the 2018 numbers uh, soon enough. But, but here's the thing that we need to know here, is that, that um, this is the same number that I was using and that was reported when I started lecturing on this topic around 2014 or so. And so what's hidden in here is what's going on inside of the coroner reports. I mean, for example, if a person dies of a, in a car accident, a blunt force trauma to the chest, that's probably what the coroner report's going to say. But, but it may not talk about the fact their blood alcohol level was, you know, 0.2 or whatever. We know that currently um, it, uh, the deaths uh, affect more men than women, and it's been that way for, for quite some time. Um, what, uh, this is, however, this is the third leading cause of preventable death in the United States. That's significant. 
The first leading cause, because I always get asked, is uh, is uh, tobacco use. And those two go hand in hand too, as well. The second would be poor diet and inactivity. Sadly, all three of those often go together. Um, but uh, these causes of preventable death tend to do, be due to things that we treat here in the treatment world in one way, shape, or form. So to put this in context, alcohol is responsible for 241 deaths per day in the United States in that same period of time as opioids. And that's 10 persons an hour. So we'll lose about 15 people while we're doing this webinar today to alcohol-related illness, motor vehicle accidents, cirrhosis, acute alcohol intoxication and toxicity, and yes, it kills a fair number of people, about at least six a day uh, in America. It's, it's, it's a lot, that's a lot of people. Um, and so this is an important topic for us to remember. The public health impact in alcohol is large and it's pervasive. And I'm gonna let this roll while we talk about a few more things as we talk about why it's important. We know that alcohol is an important issue for our emerging adults and specifically in our teens. It's associated with deaths and the three leading causes of death for 15 to 24 year olds. That's accidents, homicides, and suicides. Alcohol is involved with all of them, okay? Um, there's an enormous number of people in this country who suffer from alcohol use disorder and it has a large uh, an impactful sub uh, public health um, issue associated with it, both in terms of cost, but also in terms of the lives of the families and the individuals and lost opportunity. And um, interestingly, and we'll, we'll see this a little bit more later, that if we look at like, what, what are the costs associated with it? Loss of work, just people not being able to show up for work because of this through uh, needing to come to treatment through uh, all of the blue flu that can happen from hangovers and uh, injury and uh, um, illness. So alcohol keeps people out of the workforce. It's absolutely a, a huge piece of our problem still with um, pregnancy. And when you look at this number, it's kind of rolling up right now. The estimate is as many as 2 to 5% of first grade students may have fetal alcohol syndrome disorders of one variation, one gradation or another. That's a large number. So just to be clear, so that we're, when we're talking with our patients and clients, the NIH has recommended that no amount of drinking is safe with pregnancy, none whatsoever. Um, and, and so we know that there's a lot of reasons that is. It's part of it's for the baby and the sake of the baby, but also there's a risk factor for miscarriage and um, uh, all types of teratogenesis, depending upon the level of alcohol use. Binge drinking, and we're gonna talk a little bit more about this. This is something we think about, oh, well, they just binge drink, and we wonder, well, is that person truly, uh, for lack of better words, an alcoholic? Do they have alcohol use disorder? Bench drinking has a huge impact in America, and we should be really clear about that. One, it's a big issue in terms of sexual assault, especially in young women in college and in the emerging adult settings. Let's be clear. One in four American women is a victim of sexual abuse and trauma. That's a big number. I find that startling. Um, I guess I found it startling until I started working with the trauma here at Sierra Tucson. Maybe I should reel that back in and, and repackage that and put it that way. Because that issue, that trauma, that has significant pernicious effects in the nervous system and the way life plays out for a lot of those young women. And it puts them at further risk later on of more trauma, more sexual abuse, substance use disorder, mood disorder. So binge drinking is absolutely an important part of this puzzle when we look at all of this. So it, it definitely bears uh, attention and our, uh, our recognition that we need to deal with that uh, the best that we can as a society, all right? And the, the, the laws and the ways that we can uh, d discourage it in terms of our, our young people which is where Alcohol Awareness Month started, but also binge drinking is popular for 
many, many ages, right? I love this quote from F. Scott Fitzgerald, and for anybody who's dealt with alcohol use disorder on a personal or professional basis, this, this, this is really a great summation that uh, for some people, you can take a drink, but then the drink takes the drink, and then the drink takes that person. Um, we're going to jump back and forth, kind of switching gears here between some large demographic surveys, and I just want to lay out a little bit of what they are, because when we look at like the, the statistics around uh, alcohol use, we need to make sure that we're, we're, we know where the data is coming from, and I try to use really good data, um, and, and so there's there's a couple that are very important, and one is called the NISARC, National Epidemiologic Survey on, um, on uh, Alcohol-Related Conditions. So this is a large study that uh, is generally done about every 10 years or so, and um, this study uh, came out in 2001, 2002, and we, then we came out um, with another study, and then another study still, the NISARC-3, and this was data that was collected from April 12th through June 13th. This is an important thing, and you may have noticed there was a New York Times article that brought this to attention, that the, the, um, the numbers from 2001 to 2 to 2012 to 13 showed a sharp uptick of alcohol use disorder. And I, I said that intentionally, alcohol use disorder, essentially severe, uh, as much as up to upwards of 44% during that time frame. Now, the persons who've come out with this, and I think this was the NIH study, um, had looked at this information and said, you know, we may want to rethink some of the, the data. And it was a little bit in um, contradiction to another large study that came out by SAMHSA, the, uh, one of the other large organizations that tracks this, and that is the National Survey on Drug Use and Health. Now, they came up, however, with a slightly different numbers, but not much more encouraging. So this is from the 2018 data, okay? They do this more frequently, roughly every year or so. And so this is past month users of substances of different types, and you can see this over in the right hand, the pie grade. The, the substances of abuse and use over here on the right, alcohol clearly outclips everything else by a long shot. Tobacco, which is probably the most addictive substance that we deal with, nicotine, very, uh, very pervasive effect as well. However, um, roughly, you know, uh, uh, half, a little less than half of, of the use of alcohol. So alcohol is clearly something that is uh, um, significant in our society. A lot of people drink alcohol. Um, I'm not suggesting people or preaching that people be teetotalers, but I am suggesting that about 10 to 12 percent of our patients and about, of the, excuse me, of the North American population um, are in need of treatment in one way, shape, or form for alcohol use disorder. That's an important piece to take home from this message, and only about 10 percent of them will actually get treatment. 10 to 20 percent. So the penetration of treatment here is abysmal. And it's an interesting point because if we look at the penetration of treatment for something like hypertension, the penetration of treatment is how many people get treatment who actually have the disease, a priori have the disease. Hypertension, about 75 percent of all patients who get, who have hypertension, get treated for hypertension. Diabetes, about 75 percent and cancer take a guess that's about 75 percent but on that point on cancer in the 1970s if for those of you in my audience who are old enough to remember remember john wayne he died of cancer it was scandalous you whispered it you said cancer i mean people didn't you know cancer had a stigma associated with it so interestingly as the stigma around a disease drops the penetration of treatment rises because the penetration of treatment, let alone the quality of cancer treatments in the 1970s, but the penetration of treatment was not nearly as high. So right now, about 11% of all individuals who have substance use disorder get treatment. So the penetration of treatment is 11%, and that speaks largely 
to that stigma that we we're talking about. Now this, this survey, the National Survey on Drug Use and Health, I'm gonna go through some of these quickly because I don't wanna bore you with death by PowerPoint, but it is an important thing to be aware of and know. It's conducted by SAMHSA in uh, virtually all the, the uh, 50 states, and it reflects in, in this most recent uh, study from 2018 where the data has been calculated that uh, 70,000 persons over the age of 12 were, were uh, were interviewed, so it's a large study. More than half adults uh, in 2018 were current alcohol users. Now that just means that they've had a drink during the past month that they had asked. And so that correlates with, um, you know, about 118 million, right, people who, who, uh, who, who drank in the last month. Now what's important that we learned out of this though is where, where's the alcohol use happening? It's really happening largely in our emerging adult population, okay? Um, we think, well, teenagers, a lot of teenagers drink, but in terms of the overarching use, it's in the 18 to 25 year old category and, uh, and, and the 26 or older. Now, what about age 27 and beyond? That's not reflected here, but we do know that a, a large portion of the more casual use uh, per se, or the college binge drinking happens in our young people, has a lot of individuals get older, their alcohol use tends to uh, somewhat normalize for back of, lack of better words. So this reflects past month use. So I talked about who drinks, right? So, okay, fine. But how would we kind of start to call this out and, and switch gears a little bit here and say, well, what do we do with this data? A lot of, lot of numbers here, Dr. Sanson. What are we gonna do with all this? So here's some numbers I do want you to remember. So high-risk drinking is defined and it was used in the NISARC study, which we mentioned, as four or more standard drinks on any day for a woman or five or more standard drinks on any day for a man. And we'll talk a little bit more about this when we talk about how alcohol use impacts women. But, um, you know, men have a higher body mass. Um, there's a difference in total body water. There is a difference in how women metabolize alcohol. So women really uh, have a lower threshold for what we consider to be high-risk drinking. Now, looking at who, who fits the bill there, right? Current binge and heavy alcohol use among people, right, uh, who are age 12 or older in 2018. This blue dot in the middle is 16.6 .6 million heavy alcohol users. So that's binge drinkers and the people we would say have alcohol use disorder. And there's some overlap there, obviously. That's a difficult one to flesh out. But let's go again and talk about what binge drinking is. So we talked about what a person's at risk for, five or more for a man, four or more for a woman. But binge drinking is defined in this study, and a good definition for you to remember is that it's in one sitting, that's over a couple hours, three hours at most, that brings your blood alcohol to the legal limit uh, for driving for most states, which is 0 0.08 grams per deciliter. Usually, that's gonna be five drinks for a man or four drinks for a woman. Now, granted, the question is, well, yeah, but doc, what if they just drink it all day? Okay, it's still, it's still high-risk drinking, but it doesn't necessarily qualify as binge drinking. So heavy drinking or high-risk drinking, to answer my own question there, and I kind of stole my thunder, is defined as five or more binge drinking occasions within the past month. So this is how we tie together binge drinking and heavy drinking along with um, what is high risk drinking. Now for men, this is another important number, okay? That is 14 drinks per week, right? And for women, that's seven drinks per week. Again, excuse me, I wanna focus on that a little bit more. So again, this is, this is where it really starts to take off a little bit with differences in uh, body habitus and enzyme um, function of men and women. So a man can consume up to 14 drinks per week, and it's right at there that we would consider that the cutoff for high risk or heavy drinking. For a woman, it's only half that, it's seven. So a man may be able to drink five drinks or more at a sitting, 
a woman, she drinks four drinks at a setting, three more drinks that week, she's considered to be a heavy drinker. Now, no sexism implied here. There's specific uh, issues at stake uh, physiologically, and it impacts women in, in a different way, and it's, it's uh, very pernicious, and we need to be aware of what those are for our female patients. Um, back to this slide, well, what's a standard drink? This one is a slippery slope for a lot of people. So if you're talking with a patient and they go, well, I just have a drink, you know, and, and if it's hard liquor, ask them to show you how much, you know, the old fingers thing, right? So a lot of what people are drinking that they call a drink, that may be actually two or three drinks, okay? So it's good to, to have this in your head and be able to think when we're assessing our patients. So a beer, 12 ounces of regular beer is a drink. But if we're talking malt liquor, no, higher alcohol content. So a lot of the hoppy beers, the IPAs, and some of the, some of the more extreme stouts even, they're running up around 7 or 8%, and malt liquor is about 8%. So we only allow 8 to 9%, uh, eight, 8 to 9 ounces of that as a drink. Five ounces of wine, that's a standard pour, okay? Now, a lot of people, if they're drinking at home, they have a glass of wine, and they're going to say, oh, no, it's just a glass of wine. Ask them how big the glass is. You know, if it's one of these big goblets where it basically pours down uh, a third of a bottle in one, in one glass, that's important to know. Same thing that it really we're looking at just just a shot is an, is of a hard liquor is is what we're talking about for a drink. So when somebody says, "Well, I have one scotch at night," how big is that scotch? And ask them to actually kind of show you with their hands. This is the one that shocks my patients, and I use this all the time in lectures and in education here at Sierra Tucson. Um, I will tell you that I, I did, yes, I got it from the Washington Post, so all, all apologies to the Washington Post, but I do cite them there. And it, uh, what it really does, however, if you look over here, this is data that is retrieved, retrieved right out of the studies we were talking about, NISARC data. When this came out, this really kind of was a shocker for people who were looking at this, and this goes back to that thing called the Pareto Law. And so what it's telling us is that the people who are drinking the most tend to be right up at the top. So this top decile, right, which is the top 10%, these are people that drink about 74 drinks in a, in a week. That's a lot of drinks. But if we come down to the next decile, that's 15.28 drinks in a week. So what did I say the cutoff was? Well, for men, it's 14. For women, it's seven in a week. So the top 20% of the consumers of alcohol here who are drink are the ones who are drinking most of the alcohol in America, right? They're consuming a, a, a significant amount. And these are the people who we know are, are suffering from alcohol use disorder. The top 50% of all alcohol is consumed by, uh, uh, that is consumed and is sold in the United States is consumed by the top 10% of all drinkers. And you might say, well, in that top 10%, maybe 10 to 20% of them are in recovery at any given time, but I'm starting to split hairs. As you go down to the next decile, it's, uh, it, it drops off significantly. These are people who have six drinks or, or, or more in a week. So these are people who, under the definitions we've laid out, really wouldn't be problem drinkers. We might have to kind of watch. They could maybe tip over into that. And below this, this is where it really drops off. With the bottom third decile, really not drinking much. A lot of my patients are shocked by this. I mean, absolutely shocked. Um, they maybe aren't shocked by how many drinks are consumed in a week once they're in treatment and they're thinking about it. But the question I get, and ask yourself this, is when you're walk, working with people is, um, so when we're, we're looking at who consumes all of this, and they'll say, I thought everybody drank, or all the people I know drink, or doc, everybody drinks. I hear this all the time. And this is a really good graphic, or at least just to pull it out and write it up on a whiteboard, which is usually how I do it, to show that, no, not everybody drinks in America. I mean, yeah, we all have people we know from high school or college that we drank with, and maybe they're not all in recovery, but, 
you know, these people, they are in recovery, and that's what we have to deal with. And not everybody in America does drink. And this is pretty good data, actually, from the NISARC, and it is backed up by um, the those people who market and sell alcohol. So I really like that slide. Um, so how big a problem is this from an economic point of view? And this is, it's interesting because the CDC hasn't updated this in about a decade. But in 2010, as I looked, and I would have updated it, but in 2010, alcohol abuse is estimated uh, to, to cost the American public, both as taxpayers and consumers, about $250 billion a year. That's $2 a drink. Now, the third piece there is the most significant. That's 77 percent are due to binge drinking. Remember, I said binge drinking; it's really impactful, and that's one in six Americans that we know that binge drinks in some way, shape, or form. Okay, because you can still slide in under those numbers we just talked about and be a binge drinker, but it's that's when a lot of the problems are happening, and a lot of those problems happen in the upper echelon of the alcohol use disorder people because this is when they're not showing up for work. And we have increased health care expenses that are rising through not just the significant things necessarily like cirrhosis and esophageal varices, um, but uh, secondary issues with, say, uh, compromised immune um, systems and increased uh, risk of infection. Um, and I think built into that, you might say, would be some of the comorbidities like smoking and hypertension that can also go hand in glove with alcohol use disorder. Alcohol clearly raises high blood pressure. And so we're gonna see that as a secondary issue as well. Um, surprisingly, I would have thought law enforcement and criminal justice would be a little bit higher, but it's really just people not showing up for work or needing to take time off for treatment. And that tends to be a very big impact upon our society. And then I think the last two points there, losses associated with motor vehicle crashes and law enforcement and criminal justice, they obviously go hand in glove. The prevalence, uh, let me, let me uh, define this a little bit because we sometimes bandy these terms around. Prevalence is how many people have a disease in any given period of time. It differs from the incidence and in some other public health um, um, definitions. So the prevalence is pretty significant here. Looking at NISARC 1 versus the NISARC 3, and this is where I told you uh, earlier that moving up over the period of about a decade, there was a big significant change here. And the change I think is most prevalent here when we look at this number down below with women. Um, the change has been high, the change has been highest in women. And that's, that's a 34% change in women over a 10 year period of time. So again, it bears looking at for a lot of different reasons. One of the questions that people have, and I, I, the slide sort of segues into it, people will ask, well, it, you know, how is it different than other drugs? You know, there are things that are different about alcohol than other drugs, and one is that it's sort of socially acceptable in so many circles as we just talked about. However, let's be clear, not everybody drinks and not everybody drinks in a, in a, in a manner that will qualify for alcohol use disorder. And people will say, well, it's, it's legal, and is it addictive like other drugs? And, of course, I think, you know, everybody in this audience probably knows exactly so. What we do know, and it's important to remember, is that the executive function, and that's the thing that lives up here in this prefrontal cortex area, really becomes hijacked over time by the lower centers of the brain. We have dopamine cues from the ventral tegmental area that move what we call rostrally towards the nose to the nucleus accumbens, which is the pleasure center in the brain. And that essentially sends a trigger up with dopamine to the prefrontal cortex and says, I am craving this right now. It's supposed to prioritize what you need for survival, water, food, sleep. Um, we spent a lot of time at Sierra Tucson talking about this because then what happens is glutamate comes back and says, go pursue that thing that you need, water, food, sleep shelter, protection. As alcohol moves higher and higher upon the survival chain, it becomes literally more important than some of those other survival uh, needs. 
And so if you've ever seen a person sit and drink vodka for seven months and really rarely drink water or eat and just come in as a young 30-something-year-old mom with uh, cirrhosis, and I'm kind of pulling that out as a case example of one of my patients, you'll know that this, this is exactly what can happen. Um, and it's a scary thing to watch. It's a, it's a powerful thing to watch. So we know that clearly with with addiction and alcohol included in this, there's a neural adaptation and there's this reinforcement of the drug craving with repeated use. There's lots of things that can go into this, but repeated use and this neural adaptation are the hallmarks of it. And then that produces the negative withdrawal effects. We have preoccupation and anticipation, and that leads us right back into the binging. Dr. Volkow and Kube down here where I've uh, cited this, they've done a lot of Sentinel work. There's a great article I would point you towards in the New England Journal that came out. It's longer ago than I think, but I, I think it's three years old, maybe two is all, that talked about the neurobiology of reward and addiction. Um, but essentially they go into this idea that these drug cues, which are activated inside of the nucleus accumbens, they activate and they reinforce our reward pathway. And then, you know, we're just craving, craving and craving, like the negative mood, the enhanced sensitivity to stress, dopamine is released during periods of stress um, in ways that we, the, the recovering alcohol and an addict doesn't even quite know. And there's this preoccupation with this uh, as time goes by. And so there's just this loss of executive functioning. And so with time, this changes our re reward pathway and it actually induces neuroplasticity. And in negative fashion, we always think of neuroplasticity as this great way of change, but it is. Remember, however, it was neuroplasticity that gets our, our substance use disorder patients there in the first place, that the neurons that fire together, rewire together, and now they're firing in a way that says, I need the drug more than I need other things to survive. So this impairs both dopamine and glutamate, the connections between our prefrontal cortex and the limbic system. And we're not able to resist the drug cues, literally. So when people are saying, why can't you make a better choice? We have all the, the you know, the, all the tools inside of the prefrontal cortex. And I do this and draw this out with my patients. And they just look at me quizzically because they know, and I, it's a gotcha question, and I just let it hang there for a few moments. Why indeed? And it's because addiction doesn't live in the prefrontal cortex where we are supposed to be making our decisions. The decisions are now being driven by the lower centers of the brain. And who gets that? Why? What's the, what's the factor? When I collect patterns of why people drink, you know, we always hear these same things. And, and do this with your patients and really apply these things. We know early use, ask the age of first drink and ask what they remember about it. It's an important thing when we're screening. Genetic load, go into it. You'll, you'll find it. Listen, it's so often there. It's 50, there's a 50% association with genetics in terms of alcohol use disorder and other substance use. But steady drinking over time, it's, you grew up where it was cultural or normative. You know, maybe your friends all did it. Maybe your family all did it. The history of trauma. There's a significant increase, statistical incidence, uh, excuse me, incidence and prevalence of trauma-related background and substance use disorder. And we know that the co-occurring mood disorders and mental illness, we talked on this earlier, these are things that are factors in the development of alcohol use disorder, depression, anxiety, bipolar disorder. ADHD, I want to I want to really underscore this for a moment. ADHD that is untreated has a 50% association with substance use disorder. Our kids are coming in and they're smoking marijuana, they're drinking early because these are kids it's hard to be that ADHD kid. It's hard to settle, it creates anxiety, it creates shame. It's, it's an important thing and when I have patients who have ADHD, if we can get the ADHD effectively treated, they have a much higher uh, rate of, uh, of success with long-term recovery. And of course, schizophrenia, personality disorders, those, those last two are very difficult to work with, but we know they're clearly associated. Mental illness and substance use disorders in America, clearly related. They go hand in glove. Uh, I'm not going to go too much into this slide and kind of bore you with the details, but take a look at it. The slides will be made, made available. But those with substance use disorder, 
right, which is the green dot over on the left. Three and eight struggled with illicit drugs, three and four struggled with alcohol use disorder, and one and eight struggled with both, okay? So that is a big number. And in the middle, those people who had mental illness and a substance use disorder, that's the blue dot in the middle, that's 9.2 million people in America. That's a lot of people who have both of those things. So we know that the co-occurring issues, it is more frequent to have substance use disorder amongst people with mental illness. Again, take a look at this slide if you get the slides and really dig in on it. This comes from SAMHSA, they share all this information. And if you look at the red, which is no mental illness, it's way down there on the, low, the, the lower end in each particular case for cigarettes, daily cigarettes, and binge drinking. And this is what they've looked at and they notice there's a correlation with our patients. The blue, right up in the middle, that there are some mental illness, but serious mental illness, these are people who smoke, they smoke a lot, and they binge drink a lot. They do this as coping mechanisms, obviously maladaptive coping mechanisms, right? And those people who have alcohol use and they're related to other substance uses, uh, clearly the, the, the green here, the past month of heavy alcohol use, these are people who are involved with polysubstance abuse. That's the point of the slide, is these things often don't run alone. We see marijuana, we see cocaine, we see um, methamphetamine use, and um, these are people who during the past year have reported to SAMHSA through the um, NDSUH study that there's a correlation. And why is it important because alcohol remains a gateway drug. It remains a gateway drug when we talk about this on our young people, these correlations with mental illness, these correlations with family dynamics and uh, breakup of the nuclear family and maladaptive patterns of, of, of uh, thinking and emoting and, and, and coping with life. Alcohol tends to be the gateway drug for most of our patients. Uh, alcohol initiates tend to be young, as you'll notice in this slide, 12 to 17. It's, it's a, this is, I know, a lot of slides. This one is really an important slide. Take a look over here. This is when people start using, okay? Listen, for the majority of those kids, it may not be a problem. But for those people who have risk through genetic load, those people who have uh, trauma, those people who are involved with uh, families and peers, groups that uh, are significantly uh, using and abusing, these are the people who are gonna go on. There is clearly an inverse relationship between early initiation of alcohol use and going on to have an alcohol use disorder later in life. Let me say it again, inverse relationship. The earlier you use, the more likely you are to go on and have a substance use disorder. There was a great study that came out a few years ago. Um, there, there's a little bit more data that's even worse since then, but I like this study. So this association uh, by Dawson et al. that was published in 2008, um, did the age of first drink and the risk of alcohol use disorder, right, is clearly um, correlated, as we've spoken of, right? So we know that it uh, that these kids tend to have um, poor decision making when they go on to start to use alcohol on a regular basis. There's reasons why that. I mean, we know it empirically; you can see it. But why? Well, this goes back just sticking with the study. We'll go into the whys in a minute. So this is really telling. The study found that individuals who started drinking before. In this one, age 15, they're far more likely to experience alcohol use disorder uh, in one way, shape, or form. And then remember, this was back in the DSM-4 days, so we would use words like alcohol dependence and alcohol abuse. Then those few people who had delayed initiation until age 18. The study goes on to show, and this still holds, that if a person starts drinking early, the likelihood of developing alcohol use disorders in adulthood is about 50% higher for persons who start drinking before the age of 15, as opposed to those people who can at least wait until they're 18. There are clear changes uh, uh, in a neural um, anatomy 
put from a neuroanatomy point of view and term in the um, uh, extended amygdala area and the um, nucleus accumbens and the ventral tegmental area and the basal stria nucleus, all these areas associated and intimately tied in with the limbic system and the reward pathway and memory of reward. And this is clearly affected in our youth. So why? Well, I would say now the number I tell my patients and that you might want to remember is that the human prefrontal cortex is maturing until about the age of 25. We kind of accept this now. So whereas we said, what's early use? We used to say, well, under the age of 15, I really tell people now under the age of 25. I know that's a big order to fill, but I can't change the science because there are three organs that are, that are uh, vital, that are affected. I mentioned them, I, so I won't, I won't uh, belabor the point for the sake of time, but the nucleus accumbens or our pleasure center is clearly changed. There is a hijacking, for lack of better words, of our prefrontal cortex, which we need to make decisions, to plan, to do abstract thinking, to think rationally. This is where our values lie. This is where we put the final stamp of choice. And in the prefrontal cortex, if that's taken offline, it becomes very impactful. And then the amygdala is affected. The amygdala, it's always in red, these two little angry red guys that are the size of almonds. We speak of it in the singular, but there's two, one in each hemisphere. They're a little bit different in men and women. The thing you need to remember about the amygdala is that it isn't always in, it's involved with anxiety and anger and fear. I always say here at, uh, 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 at Sierra Tucson, if, if we're looking at an AMA and then leading against a medical advice, there's always an ALA that precedes it, an angry little amygdala. It's really true, and we can get people to settle in and uh, rethink things. They, they often tend to stay engaged in treatment. So in this adolescent brain, both white matter and gray matter are, are pruning. They're going through this period of time where this waxing and waning of growth within the axons and the dendrites. And it's like a tree that you grow and then prune back and it grows out more healthy and you prune it back. It's, a, it's an important natural part of neuronal maturation. So when this is taken offline, there's this neurochemical immaturity. And what it does is it affects this uh, limbic system, this mesocortical limbic system that we've been talking about, and it contributes to the vulnerability of future use. So what's the take home point of this? If we can preclude, if we can prevent our young people from drinking and using drugs, we're gonna have a huge public health impact. And I know since time immemorial, this has been like fighting back the tide with a bucket, but it is an important thing that we need to do as practitioners and in education of our patients and as uh, uh, you know, business owners and, and whoever my audience is today. I know there's a lot of different people, right? So it's an important piece of, of our public health and uh, um, education. Um, women are impacted differently than men. I've mentioned this a few times. This is This to me bears mentioning because when we're dealing with our female patients, you may notice a difference, especially if you're paying attention to it. There is an, uh, uh, a phenomenon wherein there's a shorter period of time at lower alcohol thresholds where certain benchmark indicators of progression into alcohol use disorder are met. In other words, women rapidly progress into alcoholism more so than men. That's really what I mean by that. We call this telescoping. It's been known about for some time, but it's really gotten more attention because what we've noticed is that there's been a flattening of the curve. We used to think it was about, one, you know, men were affected uh, like five times more uh, than women. And this is actually now really changed. It's really the women have caught up. And we know this from some of those big studies. Again, that's why I talked about NISARC and the NDSUH, where we get the data from. And we know that uh, um, it, it, it started to have an impact in our women. Um, we've noticed that an uptick, and remember it was a 34% increase in, in our female patients. 
Um, there, there may be a lot of reasons in that that we could flesh out in terms of what's going on psychosocially in, in, in America and in our patients. But looking at the whys of it, physiologic and psychologically, we can talk about the, some obvious ones. Women tend to have a smaller body mass, more adipose tissue, less total body water. And this, this, this fourth one here, alcohol dehydrogenase is an enzyme that is in the stomach of, our, of all of us. And essentially what it does is it helps us um, metabolize alcohol and we don't women don't have as much of it and if you don't have as much of it there's a bigger load of alcohol that drops out of the stomach into the duodenum or the, the small, small small intestine right off of the stomach and it goes right into the liver so there's a decrease what we call first pass metabolism so the effects are more profound in women because of enzyme differences women drink for different reasons they're more likely to consume due to stress and their um, um, they're more likely to have past trauma. And that's an important point to remember as well, that why women drink less, it's different than men. Men sometimes drink a little bit more collegially and it's a, a little bit more the, the culture for men. That's, that's not completely true as we all know, but we do see that in our patients. And women are very unlikely to have a co-occurring psychiatric disorder. They also have a lot of shame. And stigma that goes with things that are unique to women and their traditional roles as caregivers, mothers, and central of the family unit. This may be some changes that have occurred in the last 20 years where we've seen some of this flat thing. Don't know. Um, I think that's a bigger conversation, but we do know the change is happening. I'm going to move kind of quickly through this next part for a few reasons. One is just to kind of get through the material, but I do just want you to know that there are validated screening tools you can use in your practice, okay? And they're an important part of what we would call um, screening, brief intervention, and referral to treatment. The three that I'm gonna talk about briefly here, and I'm not gonna spend a lot of time with them, I want you to know they exist, and I want you to you know, maybe take some time to look them up. The first one is the CAGE. I really like this one because it's associated, um, very clearly associated with the um, DSM-5, and it's easy to remember. CAGE is an acronym, and it just says, have you ever felt the need to cut down on your drinking? Have you ever felt annoyed when somebody's criticizing you? Have you ever felt guilty? Have you ever needed that early morning drink? So people who have tested positive for this, it's easy to remember, but it's very sensitive and specific, meaning you know, it works for screening out who actually does and does not have alcohol use disorder. But there's another one, the tweak, and we, we, it's basically just an amalgamation of the cage. We add in tolerance. How many drinks can you hold? Are you parent, are people worried about you, friends or relatives? Do you have that eye opener? Have you had blackouts? There's a lot of physiologic reasons why blackouts occur, and it has to do with the brain's, um, uh, what we call allosteric modulation in the, the mesolimbic pathway. Big fancy words, and what that really means is that um, part of where alcohol works is, is with memory and learning, and we blunt that effect. And so if you're drinking enough that that's not working, you know you're drinking quite a lot. And if you tried to cut down, if you felt the need to cut down, the tweak um, is scored out that if you answer six or more to the first question, like how many drinks are you having, or there's a total of three or more, it denotes a need. Where it's... Um, we really see that it's good is with our pregnant patients. So it's important to remember, if you're working with women, you might want to keep the tweak in your arsenal. Now, the audit C is a little bit long, is a, is a shorter form of the audit, but, but what it does is it uses the first questions of the audit, the 10 item audit. And this is one you may want to have your patients use in the waiting room. Um, and basically it breaks down thus, have you, do you, how often do you drink? How many standard drinks? Have you ever had six or more drinks on one occasion? And the cutoff scores are three for women, four for men. Again, um, you know, men get a little more of a break because of all the reasons that we talked about. Um, and it is also sensitive and specific for alcohol use disorder. And this one is better for adolescents and emerging adults than the cage. So it's important to remember, you know, there's, there's actually multiple um, screening tools, right? But 
once they're screened and you send them off to maybe a physician or if there are any physicians here who are who are involved with this remember what we need to do is we need to see nowadays do you fit into the dsm-5 criteria alcohol is taken in larger amounts persistent desire or unsuccessful effort to cut down a great deal of time is spent in activities necessary to obtain just to, are, you, are you using a lot of alcohol and spending time doing it is there a strong craving and using it recurrently and what's happening is you can't fulfill your obligations work school home we don't ask about legal issues anymore but can you not keep up with the obligations of your life and if you had recurrent these two go together in my mind but they are separate uh, as a question are you having persistent recurrent social or interpersonal problems and are you giving up the social occupation social or occupational recreational activities in other words are you isolating are you able to keep up with the demands of your life? And are you using it when it's physically hazardous? So we don't even necessarily need to know if you had a DUI. We want to know are you drinking and driving? And that you are using it in spite of the fact that you know that it has negative effects. And these two biggies here at the end are, do you have tolerance? And there's a withdrawal, which basically talks about dependence. In other words, if you don't have the drug on board, do you have characteristic withdrawal symptoms and tolerance is basically we need more and more drug to produce the same effect so remember 246 that if you have two or more of those symptoms it's mild if you have four or more of those we call that moderate alcohol use disorder and severe alcohol use disorder is the presence of six or more we don't use abuse anymore we don't you know these are the words that we use they're non-shaming and non-stigmatizing now a lot of people still suffer from alcohol use disorder. And if you look at any given period of time, what's the prevalence here? And we do see more alcohol use disorder in this time in, in these individuals, the 18 to 25 year olds. And it drops off a little bit after 26. Some of these people may have been in treatment. Some of them, some of them may have been able to cut back and drop out of some type of, say, maybe alcohol use disorder mild. Um, the effects of alcohol uh, on our health are, are significant, they're pernicious, they're widespread. It affects the liver, obviously, in a progression from fatty liver to hepatitis to cirrhosis. Wernicke's Korsakoff syndrome has to do with the depletion of uh, our B vitamins from the alcohol, and uh, there's a specific syndrome that's associated that affects memory and loss and thinking. Uh, we know it causes hypertension, and secondarily to that, it's involved with cardiovascular disease, and it is associated with so many types of cancer. The withdrawal syndrome is exceptionally dangerous in alcohol and should not be done on its own. So there's withdrawal-related seizures, and there's risk of fall, hemorrhage. Uh, people don't clot well because of liver issues, and uh, a lot of people aspirate or lose their airway. Um, delirium tremens is essentially when a person becomes delirious and have, has hallucinations and delusional thinking and is usually associated with the seizures, but certainly a, a, a hyperdynamic cardiovascular state. The other thing, it doesn't quite fit there with withdrawal, but I put it here because a lot of times this is where you need to be very, very sensitive about checking for suicidality. Remember this number, about a quarter of all suicides involve a blood alcohol content uh, over the legal limit of 0 0.08. We have always associated this when we switch gears to how do we deal with this. We know this is always this really kind of eerie spiritual connotation. The word alcohol, and I, I'm, a, I'm a history nerd. I find this very interesting. This stuff around the, the, the eyes here in our, in our little models, this is called coal. And we found this, you know, in the Egyptian hieroglyphics. And it was antimony sulfide, and it was distilled. And we think that the alchemists in Alexandria, Egypt, were probably the first people to do this. And it meant the essence of something. And the word alcohol became intertwined then with, with ghoul. That's where we get the English word ghoul from. And it, 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 the etymology of the word always had to do with this alcohol or al ghoul. At one time, it became... And I, for my Arabic speakers, I'm sure I'm slaughtering this El Igtial. And it means to knock down swiftly or something that knocks down the brain. So 
this word really became the thing and the thing became the word, we still use alcohol by legal spirits. And it's important because um, Carl Jung, the infamous, or excuse me, the famous Carl Jung and the infamous Bill Wilson, the founder of, of AA, were in correspondence about a patient and Carl Jung wrote about this. That how do we how do we fix this problem? And down here at the bottom, he wrote this wonderful letter to him, and it, it said "Spiritus contra spiritum," which is really kind of a, a bastardized Latin way of saying we fight the spirits with the spirit. In other words, Jung knew that that until um, Bill and Bob got together and codified um, some sort of a pathway that people could actually work through some issues and engage recovery as opposed to fight addiction which is something i use with my patients all the time i want them to engage recovery because trying to fight addiction can be in the losing battle and we don't often think of it that way but we need to remember that this idea of fighting the spirits with the spirit is important we still consider alcohol legal spirits by law i mean this this still has a connotation that's important today so I'm going to give a little plug for AA. We are not a particularly heavy 12-step program, but I, I certainly like the 12 steps. Um, I'm a person in long-term recovery. I found these to be very impactful in my life. And I'll tell you what, there's been a lot of poo-pooing of AA one way or the other. And uh, this, this bears mentioning that a recent Cochrane report uh, came out and they reviewed, re-reviewed some earlier reports and they show that you know people who actually use Alcoholics Anonymous as a part of their recovery program tend to be far more um, uh, successful than individuals who do not statistically speaking and that's an important thing for us to remember as a tool for our patients right um, and so um, this another study right funded by the NIH and published in addiction stated that in summary Treatment employing an AA facilitation strategy was strongly therapist directed, resulted in more AA meetings attended, more active AA involvement, and more abstinent days during portions of the year following treatment relative to treatment that placed no special emphasis on AA. So it's, it is kind of specific to Alcoholics Anonymous. So you know what? It does work along with all the other things that we do, and I, I just want people to remember that. But I tell my patients it's never the one thing. It is always all of it. We need to make sure we're treating the comorbidities and treating the mind, body, and spirit. We treat them together. We don't treat them separately. We don't treat them sequentially. We treat co-occurring disorders concurrent with the substance use disorder. We are trauma-informed here at Sierra Tucson, and so it's a very important thing for us. I mean, this, this is not the lecture. I do one called Trauma, Shame, and Addiction. How do we get here? How do we change? And it speaks about this pernicious effect of trauma. And this integrated care, it's, it's important to remember that it's not only medical and psychotherapy, but there really is this spiritual path. I love this quote about the spiritual path. You don't have a soul. You are a soul. You have a body. And so when we're thinking with our patients and working with our patients and talking with our patients and sharing with our patients, what does their spiritual path to recovery look like? How do we calm the amygdala? How do we reshape our thinking, new neuroplasticity towards bringing back the prefrontal cortex online? How do we think of others instead of just thinking of ourselves? How do we embrace our recovery instead of our, looking at our addiction? So in summary, you know, when this pandemic's over, we're going to have learned a whole lot of things about this virus and about its treatment. There's been a lot about politics and the media and our response and the economy. And I hope we look at what did we do right and what did we do wrong. What I'm really kind of fearful of is that what we may be left with is the greatest casualty of COVID-19, which is yet to come, which is the collateral damage. And I think we need to pay attention to this. Because alcohol use disorder, alcohol consumption still remains a very large problem in terms of uh, what we treat here at Sierra Tucson, and I'm sure where you're treating patients as well. So with that, I, uh, I'm finishing up, and uh, we've got some questions, and I appreciate it. You're a great audience. So, um, so where are we at here? 
Um, here's a good one. So can Drizzly at least check for the age of a person who's ordering? You know, okay, so I haven't ordered off of Drizzly because I'm in long-term recovery. So, uh, you know, I don't know. I've studied Drizzly from afar in an academic manner. Um, I think like most of those things, they do check how, how they find out. Um, you know, I don't know. I suspect in all honesty, I mean, uh, underage drinkers don't seem to have a hard time getting it. So I think that's that's important. Um, so thank you for that really good question. Uh, yeah, so it says, I guess this was asked a little while ago, what is the thinking about, and maybe you'll get to, it says maybe you'll get to this, but what is the thinking about the quote shocking, and I agree, increase in drinking issues, especially for women? Yeah, that is a great question. And uh, maybe I throw that out there almost rhetorically because, one, I want people to understand that women are impacted differently than men. And we need to take that into effect, or excuse me, into account when we're dealing with our patients. Um, and you'll notice this when you pay attention to a woman that way in their story. Listen, I know men who really have the same amount of shame, fear. I'm losing my family, my role is as a provider and a dad, and you know, they're good people with a bad disease. Um, you know, women um, traditionally have, have been tied up a little bit more in that family and caretaker role. Um, that has obviously blurred as more and more women have entered into the workplace over, it certainly didn't happen 10 or 20 years ago. And women are a vital part of the workplace now, accounting for over 50%, so really they're driving a lot of our economy. But I do think um, that there may be a difficult uh, thing for women in terms of balancing those roles. And I, you know, whether that's fair or not, and I, that's a that's a really good question. I don't know. I think it's hard. I think that's that that comes true when I talk with my female patients about what's going on with them. Women seem to really be able to identify their shame much more quickly than men do. Um, and I think as a result, I suspect that what they're doing is they're identifying it before they ever get to treatment. And that shame drives a lot of their drinking. I would refer you to Brene Brown's great works, um, especially I thought it was just me, but it isn't about women in shame. Um, and I think, I, I think that just uh, perhaps we're paying more attention to the issue too, and that may be a reflection of the numbers. I think there's a lot more to it than that. Um, and I don't know if it's been well studied. Um, there was, well, let me say, and I, maybe I can ham-handedly pull it up. There was, however, a, a, um, a really great article. Uh, give me a second. I'm going to see if I can fling this back. There's a gal at the, uh, she's a, a doc at, um, in Har the Harvard system. Uh, specifically, I think she's at, um, Oh, you know what? I, I'm going to kind of stumble around for this, and I don't want to do that while I'm answering questions. Um, I'll try to get this information out to you. That um, here it is. Um, nope, not there. Sorry. Uh, in the um, um, from the Harvard system about women and shame and the telescoping effect and how it's impacted them and. I'll about, I think that's it, so I just try to email that to you, okay? Um, otherwise, I'm going to just sit here and look for it. So, um, how can these ch changes to neuroanatomy be reversed? Really good question, because that's what we talk about. So, one, neuroanatomy, right, is, is this idea, it's, it's really a neuroplasticity thing, okay? So, I really should say neurobiochemical changes. Okay, so that we know that there are changes in the brain's reward pathway that after a while are reinforced with the use of alcohol and other drugs through the dopaminergic pathway. And what happens is over time, literally, the motivators for the alcohol and for a drug become reinforced as it moves from the limbic system up to the prefrontal cortex. The prefrontal cortex then responds by saying, okay, I will go pursue that. That's its job. I, it thinks about it. How do I get what I need? For example, if you're thirsty, you're going to go off and you're going to find, you're going to go find the well, right? 
um, if you're if you're hungry, you're going to go out and maybe you've got to you know kill the deer to bring it home for the rest of the tribe to eat. Well, you will pursue that, and you send glutamate back. As things climb higher and higher on their survival pathway, that becomes hijacked. Literally, the alcohol it becomes more important than survival, and it takes time and neuroplasticity to change it that way. So, how do we change it back through neuroplasticity? How is that affected? One is through a thing called brain-derived neurotrophic factors, and that can happen with medications, specifically if there's comorbidities such as anxiety and depression and things that are underlying. Along with therapy, we know those people make the most BNRFs, at least that's theoretically, and, uh, and there's some, some, some uh, studies to back that up. That's what we believe. But that neuroplasticity, this idea that I talked about, spirit as contra spiritum, that really speaks to this because that's talking about neuroplasticity. That's talking about a spiritual change. Look, however you define spirituality in your life, there needs to be something different that, that helps to change the neurocognition of the brain. This is why I tell my patients it's important for us to embrace the recovery rather than fight the addiction. Otherwise, we're really never living forward thinking into what that looks like, what is neuroplasticity, um, the, that sort of a thing, okay? So a lot more to that question, and I, you know, um, really appreciate it. It's something we work with our patients on a whole lot. Um, one consistent finding is that comorbid alcohol dependence and depression is associated with an increased risk of suicidal ideation. Absolutely. Um, and I spoke to that just somewhat in showing that 25% um, of all completed suicides is 24% had a blood alcohol content of 0 0.08. And obviously, they needed to start off with, uh, uh, with suicidal ideation. And uh, so, yeah, that's important. Do you offer medications for treatment for alcohol use? Yes, you know, um, there is a significant uptick in individuals who get involved with a long-term program of recovery, which is working on these neuroplasticity uh, models here at Sierra Tucson, associated with medically associated treatments such as naltrexone, for example. I'm a fan of naltrexone in particular because naltrexone works at that nucleus accumbens we spoke about, the brain's reward pathway. Essentially, what it does is it binds to opioid receptors. Now, alcohol, interestingly, changes into a polypeptide that affects the opioid receptors. And this is where we get a reward. And when that reward releases dopamine, that's the thing that triggers those drug cues. Remember this, too. When we speak of drug cues, a lot of times we think very linearly and traditionally, like seeing alcohol, smelling alcohol, being around the old people, places, and things. I tell my patients, and for most of them, the biggest drug cues are internal. Their thoughts, memories, moods, emotions, trauma, anxiety, depression. And we do know that the MAT works well on that. And doing that coupled with a long-term program of recovery, remember this thing. Most relapses, 80% of all relapses occur in the first 90 days. That's according to the National Institutes of Drug Abuse, Dr. Miller of Volkow's organization through the NIH. Um, a lot of good questions here. Uh, yeah, well, what if an individual does not like group settings such as AA? What else can be used to improve? Oh, I get this all the time. And I tell them, look, it doesn't matter to me. You don't have to do AA, although I think it is shown to be statistically um, uh, significant. But the people that do the best are engaged in a program of recovery. If you want an empiric kind of colloquial hook for that patient, you ask them, how did you drink? And they probably, probably isolated. If they say, I was a bar drinker, I'll commonly ask my patients, how many of you were drinking in a bar and you were totally alone? Right? And the hands go up. So the isolation is really, is really important. Um, so, uh, you know, if we want to, we need to move away from that and we need to be around people who can check our kind of thinking. What I do like about AA is that it's everywhere, but there's also NA, uh, smart recovery, young people in recovery, celebrate recovery. Um, there may be group therapy that's really impactful. So there's a lot of things, you know, that they can do. Um, yeah, this is a good one. Why were liquor stores considered essential during the pandemic? 
yeah, I know. And and Alcoholics Anonymous was considered to be a bigger risk, as were a lot of other, you know, spiritual based things like churches and places where you might have an AA meeting or just people come together for for um, their own their own well being. It's been a tough one. I don't know. I I mean, I appreciate what you're saying. Um, certainly, we sold a lot of alcohol during this, and we still continue to. Um, based upon the presentation, will there be more alcoholics in 2020? Uh, oh boy, really good question. You know, don't know. It certainly seems that we may see an uptick. We're going to have to pay close attention to that. Um, we'll know more when the data from the next NISARC and NDSU studies come out. That's when we get seem to get uh, uh, the best data around that. Um, and I think I understood this to be said, helping with the comorbidity of mental illness is to treat the mental illness in conjunction with addiction, um, not one or the other. Yeah, that is truly what we mean when we say integrative care. Integrative is an interesting term and it gets bandied around a lot. Um, it's a great word, it means a lot of different things, but when we think about this, it means really that we're treating the mind, body, and spirit all at once. So it's important to say, well, you know what, just get sober and then you can deal with your anxiety or your trauma. I can tell you that I have patients who come in and say, I've been through four or five big name treatment centers, but I've never dealt with the trauma, right? And that's an important thing. Um, anxiety and ADHD, if those aren't dealt with, it's very difficult for people to go out and stay sober long enough to go deal with them. So it's important to recognize that these things go hand in glove, that they're clearly correlated, and uh, they, they work together in, in a synergistic fashion in, uh, in a negative way for our patients. So it's really important that we can treat them all together. That tends to be the most efficient, efficacious, impactful, and has the best statistical outcomes. Um, you may have covered this. Do women... Uh, I tend to have more dual diagnosis. Yeah, there was a slide that did mention that uh, briefly. Obviously, there's an enormous amount of material uh, and kind of clipping through it fast. Yes, they do have a high incidence of dual diagnosis. Um, what happens in the brain of a person who drinks alcohol while using naltrexone? Um, you know, they can still become intoxicated, but for some people, it blunts the effect. Um, at, at worst case, and that will best if they drink, you know, we would hope that the worst case scenario is they don't go back to drinking as much with the naltrexone. What it really is there though to do is to cut the cravings. Um, we're kind of running down to the end here. A lot of great questions. What are your thoughts on the significant increase in the seltzer beers, Bud Light, et cetera, White Claws uh, that are 5% and encourage, especially to women because they're quote low carb. It's marketing. It's the Pareto law. You know, when we watch the Super Bowl and you see the funny beer commercials, listen, you know, everybody watches it. It's like Doritos, you know, you're watching them. But they are still geared towards the top 20% of consumers. And really, writ large, in this case, the top 10% of those consumers are consuming 50% of all the alcohol that's sold. Um, so I'm kind of running to the end of questions. These were great. And uh, I hope that that means that you enjoyed what we had to say. Um, uh, Courtney will tell you we're available for other questions via email uh, the best that I can. I get a lot of emails, so I'll do my very best. And I did say I would try to get some information on women. So uh, I will talk with Courtney about how we might be able to make that article available. But there was some good, uh, a good review article out of, uh, out of Harvard uh, in McLean Hospital and uh, a woman who's done a lot of Sentinel work up there. Apologies, I didn't have that on the tip of my tongue for you. But uh, I do appreciate your time. I appreciate you listening. And thank you so very much today.